Let us have our colleagues from the advanced quantum test bed at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the US join us. We have uh, three distinguished scientists with us. Kasra Nauruzi, the head of hardware at AQT. Anastasia Butko, the career scientist in the computational research division at, at the same uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Very interesting. She focuses mostly on computer architecture with emphasis on high performance computing and looks how can we keep scaling in this era where we are basically post Moore's law. And then it is our pleasure to have Zara Petram Razi joining us, a project scientist in uh, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and she focus on the, focuses on the fabrication and the characterization of novel superconducting qubits. Wonderful, happy to have you here. Would you like to share a bit more, Kasra? What is the advanced quantum test bed? Uh, why have we scheduled this uh, right after the uh, the interfacing a qubit presentation by Zurich Instruments? How does everything interface here uh, together? Perfect. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present, Marlou. Uh, so again, my name is Kasra Naruzi. I'm the head of hardware for the advanced quantum test bed. Uh, so the the role that we play the the Obviously, the, the quantum computing community has grown uh, substantially over the last few years, uh, and not everyone has their own uh, full stack quantum computing hardware to actually run their ideas and develop their protocols and methods. And so uh, the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy uh, over the last five years has sponsored two uh, quantum testbed facilities uh, programs. Uh, one is based on trapped ions, our sister program. Uh, QScout uh, based at Sandia National Labs. And uh, the advanced quantum test bed is the superconducting uh, test bed, uh, which is operated, uh, developed and operated at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab for the US Department of Energy. And so what we do is we develop uh, and deploy full stack superconducting uh, quantum computers. We work on everything from individual uh, superconducting uh, qubits to developing gates between two qubit samples to working on architecture of uh, quantum processors and exploring that space. Uh, and then we have a number of cryostats where we house these quantum processors. Uh, then we work on uh, room temperature control electronics, uh, partly in-house and partly in partnership with our uh, partner Zurich Instruments over the last few years. Um, and then on top of that, we have a software stack uh, with compilation and optimization tools. And so once you have all of this full stack, then you can uh, run uh, QIS experiments. And uh, we operate a user program. Every year we receive uh, a few tens of proposals from applicants from industry, from academia, and from national labs. And uh, after a review process and down selection, we work with, uh, with, we work with our uh, users. Uh, we give them deep access to every part of the full stack and, uh, and deep access collaboratively to our uh, scientists. And we run these projects for a few months at a time you know, for, for a project, and we publish jointly together. Uh, so that is the advanced quantum test bed. Uh, so today, I'm, uh, together with my colleagues, uh, Anna Buko and Zahra Padramrazi, we're going to give you a tour, uh, a virtual tour uh, of uh, some of our labs. And uh, we will close the loop on how Zurich instruments and control systems fit into all of this. Great. And this will also be a really good addition to the superconducting qubit lecture by Kyle Zerniak from uh, MIT Lincoln Lab that we had last week. Zara Padam Razi, uh, could you share a bit more about your role at AQT and about at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab? Hi, yeah, sure. Uh, so I joined AQT about two years ago and I work on uh, designing uh, fabrication and characterization of new novel uh, qubits. So in specific um, in our lab, we're interested. So there's trans one that everyone is working on, but there are uh, novel qubits that have some noise protected uh, uh, characteristics. And so uh, if we can uh, focus and achieve uh, quantum processors uh, with those uh, with those qubits, we can have uh, a higher coherence, uh, lower uh, error, uh, error, errors in our gate and higher fidelity and also like different algorithms that we can run. Uh, so 
for example, some, some of them are biased noise protected that allows uh, new types of gates that were not possible previously with transmon. So uh, in specific, I'm working on fluxonium. So uh, designing of uh, fluxonium qubits and like fabrication of it and also um, uh, characterization, like measurements. And uh, we actually work with, uh, use some of the ZI instruments for the measurements of uh, some of the qubits that we're working on. Another qubit that uh, I'm also working on is Kerkag qubits, which is another uh, type of uh, novel qubit that has a, a snail instead of only having like a single transmon. And um, so, yeah, so that's basically uh, what I'm doing. <laughs> Great. And we have Anastasia Putko with us. What is your role at AQT and beyond? Yeah, so um, yeah, so as as you pointed out, I'm a classical kind of computer architect. So um, I I found it very interesting to um, explore and apply my background in classical architectures uh, for the problems in the uh, quantum computing architecture. So um, uh, as as Asra uh, Kasra mentioned, the we have. Um, we have a, a control stack, uh, which is uh, kind of open for us to explore and develop, which is different from you know what the industry is providing. So we kind of uh, have a chance to uh, touch every single piece of that and working with the users and uh, scientists from all of the levels to um, build the most efficient, the most um, friendly uh, and flexible uh, uh, control uh, hardware as we as we can. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so my role was to uh, uh, build an instruction set architecture that would uh, facilitate the communication in between the interfaces between uh, software layers and the hardware layers. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And we have this whole team here to whom you can all ask questions uh right now but first also Kasra will start the virtual lab tour um showing around in a in a virtual reality tour Arash and Bruno from Zurich Instruments will stay on so please put all your questions on the discord and uh, myself and the team will then share them with everyone from Zurich Instruments and AQT here Kasra I know the facilities look amazing so please show them to us of course my pleasure so uh, I will share my screen. Can everybody see this? It is starting. Yes. And here we go. Okay. So uh, this is, by the way, this tour is on our website. If you go to, uh, to aqt.lbl.gov, uh, in the About menu, there's, there's a link to this virtual tour. So everyone can explore this on their own uh, as well. Uh, so uh, I will cover the uh, the measurement lab part of this, uh, and then uh, uh, together with Anna, and then we will hand it off to Zara for the fabrication part. Um, so this is uh, this is the entrance to one of our uh, few labs. Uh, this is in the basement of Campbell Hall, the physics department at, at UC Berkeley, and uh, we have precision uh, control over the temperature there, and there's low vibration. Everything is set up for precision instruments. This is why we operate in this environment. Uh, and uh, we work, by the way, we work, we get a lot of questions about the art. We work with a local artist uh, in Oakland by the name of Ben Arismendi, uh, who takes uh, our diagrams and uh, and equations from from lab members and turns them into modern arts, as you see here. So uh, stepping into the lab, this is what the this is what a typical measurement lab looks like. We have three cryostats here in this uh, in this particular room, and uh, the desks are, as you see, are co-located right next to the measurement uh, systems. Uh, so that uh, the researchers working on these systems would have direct access, uh, not not really being separated from from the instruments and the tools. Uh, so, if I start with a smaller lab, uh, smaller system, uh, you can see here this is an example of uh, a smaller dilution fridge, and uh, just a few lines. And uh, you can see the the experiment would sit here at the bottom. Uh, at 10 millikelvin, and you would have these lines that that uh, allow you to send signals in and to do measurements and then read out your qubits. 
uh, I will move on to a larger system um, and use that to actually go through the details. So our largest cryostat is made by Blue Force here. It has 160 radio frequency lines. Uh, the qubits, uh, transmons, or uh, well, Zara will tell you a little bit more about fluxonium as well. Uh, transmons have been the standard so far, but they're mostly on their way out over the next few years. Uh, the frequency ranges are between, you know, for us, it's roughly between five to six gigahertz for control and between six to seven gigahertz for, for readout. Um, the sample would sit here at the, at the bottom inside shielding protected uh, from electromagnetic noise in the environment. Uh, and then on the other end of it, uh, you have the control systems in these racks. So uh, I, I trust you've learned uh, from our Zurich Instruments friends uh, how, uh, how you can turn your abstract quantum circuit experiments into uh, radio frequency pulses that you send into the fridge. So that starts here. Well, really, it starts over there with the, with the researchers at their computer screens programming everything, um, uploading into the FPGA-based control systems. And uh, then these FPGA-based control systems turn those into radio frequency pulses. Uh, so I won't belabor the point of how these control systems work. Um, but uh, when, once you get the signal out, uh, they go through these radio frequency coax cables on top, up to the top of the fridge, up to the top of the cryostat, and uh, they come in through the top, and then there are multiple layers here. Let me, let me stand over here so that we can be a little bit taller. Okay, so these cryostats work in several steps. Uh, at the very top, you have the room uh, temperature uh, plate, and then step by step, you, you go down to 50 Kelvin, four Kelvin at this plate over here, uh, and then about a Kelvin over here, and uh, you have the base plate at 10 millikelvin sitting here. And these work in, in, in there are two separate cooling mechanisms involved. One is uh, purely compression of helium-4 uh, by these compressors, one sitting over on this side, another one sitting in this other corner. So they basically compress helium-4 uh, and dump the heat into the room, and the compressed, uh, the compressed gas goes into the fridge, absorbs the heat, expands and comes out and the cycle repeats. So it's very similar to how your fridge at home would operate except that the gas is helium four. Uh, so that gets you down to four Kelvin. And uh, then there's a separate process relying on the phase dynamics of helium three, helium four mixture uh, to drive down to 10 millikelvin. And I won't get into the details of how that works. Uh, so that's one of the jobs of a cryostat like this is to cool down to 10 millikelvin so that uh, uh, you can achieve both achieve superconductivity and also be low enough temperature so that by default, your qubit state sits at zero so that you don't end up spontaneously exciting to higher states. Uh, and then the other job of the, of the cryostat is to provide a pathway uh, to access the qubits while uh, uh, excluding environmental noise. And so that's what these stages of radio frequency wires do. And uh, they, uh, at every step, uh, step of the way, uh, from plate to plate, you will have uh, attenuators that, that decrease the signal strength by a factor of about 120 dB. Uh, so uh, that, that basically allows you to filter out black body radiation from higher plates due to just thermal energy. Uh, so that at the very end of it, you will just end up with a couple of photons uh, reaching your actual uh, qubits. And that's how you can actually control them and, and, and do readout. Um, so for this, uh, we work with both our partners, Zurich Instruments. We've, been, uh, we've had a very fruitful partnership over the last four years. Uh, uh, so they can see how their instruments work in an actual quantum lab uh, and, and improve upon it. And... Uh, if we require new features that our users demand fancier uh, capabilities to do more sophisticated experiments, uh, Zurich Instrument scientists have been working with us to implement those uh, to advance uh, these features, for, uh, these devices and instruments further, which is possible because everything is based on, on uh, FPGAs, which are uh, programmable. 
Uh, and aside from that, then we have our own open source control system as well. Uh, at, at, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, we developed the world's first uh, open source uh, FPGA based control system for superconducting qubits. And we call that qubic uh, for standing for qubit control. Um, and all, everything about that is published and open sourced so that uh, other, other uh, universities and labs can uh, just buy a Xilinx board and download our firmware gateware software and, and they will be ready to do measurements. And part of what, you know, the reason for that is so that we could have more customized detailed access to every part of the control system. Um, and part of it is also to, you know, interface it to develop uh, higher capabilities on top. And so I will pass it on to Anastasia Butko, who will tell you a little bit about uh, the power that can be gained by adding uh, an instruction set architecture, ISA, that comes from classical computing. Uh, if you add that on top of your quantum measurement system, uh, what, you can, what you can gain and what it is to begin with. Anna? Sorry, it was muted. Um, yeah, so um, it, Qubit by itself can um, do a lot of... Um, a lot of different like experiments, but uh, what we decided is that uh, we would add another layer to this control system that would allow us to uh, have more uh, control flexibility and control power on the board. Uh, so when uh, Castro was showing you uh, our setup at the beginning where a user uh, works behind his uh, laptop and uh, kind of loads the uh, experiment uh, software to the FPGA. Uh, what happens if we do not have any uh, control processor on the FPGA is that uh, most of the decision needs to be made uh, during the compilation process uh, um, at the laptop of the user, uh, which means that if something during the experiment uh, it requires to make a fast decision, something like uh, fast feedback um, uh, and have some uh, some kind of control loop, uh, then that won't be possible or it would be very hard to implement that. So, and for this reason, we um, implemented the control processor that uh, that kind of controls the, the way the experiment flows through the um, through the analog backend, and then uh, if we're doing, uh, let's say, if we're doing a measurement of some qubits, and we would like to continue um, an algorithm, an experiment uh, uh, in a different way based on the uh, measurement, so uh, we can do this uh, through the uh, through the instruction set architecture that um, we implemented. Yeah, so uh, we call it Quasar. That stands for quantum instruction set architecture. So. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kasra. <laughs> thank you, Anna. Uh, and, and this will become more and more important as uh, cryogenic control systems are developed over the next couple of years. Uh, so uh, from here, I will then pass it on to Zara, who will uh, tell you about how these quantum processors are actually made uh, in, in the fabrication lab. And uh, let me stop sharing. Oops. Um, do you guys see the screen that I'm sharing? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you, Kasra and Anna, for, uh, for that introduction. So let's uh, take a look at our uh, fabrication room and uh, where we actually make, I, I would like to say where the magic happens. This is where we make all the qubits that we can then measure and do all the cool gates and different measurements on. Uh, so this is kind of unique that we do have, a, a, oh, sorry. What happened? Uh, oh no. Um, Asra, are you here? I I am here. I don't know what happened to Zara. Yeah. Well, are you, uh, are you, can you share your screen? I can. But, oh, uh, have you been sharing? Uh, I, I I think I stopped sharing, right? So that what what you were seeing that was Zara's. Uh, oh, that was Zara's. Okay. Yes. You stopped sharing, and Zara briefly went away. Let's discuss some questions until Zara returns. Yes. <clears throat> First, some big compliments, beautiful VR and beautiful DRs as well. There are some questions uh, about high temperature superconductors. 
uh, would it help if we get to higher temperatures for superconductivity and how would that reduce the noise? Um, so it's not, as I, as I mentioned, the, 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 the problem with superconducting quantum computing is not just reaching superconductivity. Uh, most schemes encode information in energy levels of these artificial atoms, right? And so the transmon is essentially an artificial atom. It has energy levels going from the ground state all the way up uh, with some anharmonicity so that you can have addressability between different states. Uh, and if you have superconductivity, but you're not low temperature enough, then by default, your transmon will sit at some excited state and you will not really have uh, even when you're not doing any computation, you will not be at the ground state. So, uh, the, so the, the, you know, the short answer is not really, not, not in these traditional schemes, traditional. In the ways that we've been doing quantum computing so far, uh, you can't just switch to a higher temperature superconductor and just do the same thing. Looks like Sarah is back. Yeah. And then a question to Zara before she starts showing everything. Uh, you shared about other types of superconducting qubits. And David from the US asks, why will uh, the Transman superconducting uh, quantum computing uh, regime go away? Why are we looking into all these better qubits? Are they better? Are they needed? You have to un. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought I was un unmuted. Okay. Um, so, the, to answer uh, that, it comes to the Hamiltonian. I would say so. If you think of a transmon, uh, it's almost like a, a harmonic oscillator. It's slightly anharmonic, and uh, you have nonlinear nonlinearity that controls uh, the gates that you can basically do, the speed that you can do, and uh, the speed of the gates, the type of uh, transitions that you can do. Uh, but when you uh, change the Hamiltonian, for example, for Fluxonium, what we're doing, we're adding a, a very long uh, superinductor. That's what we call it. It's like a chain of uh, many small, uh, many big junctions that uh, give an L to your uh, LC circuit, basically. And so then you change the shape of your Hamiltonian, and now you have a phase that is important. Uh, and, and so the type of solutions that you can have, the type of gate that you can do, everything is different. So when, when someone says a novel qubit or when someone says like a qubit, like a flux qubit or any qubit that is not like, basically when we name a qubit, what we're trying to say is that we're changing something in the Hamiltonian. And by changing that, we're changing the space and the type of gates that we can operate on that uh, qubit. So. Wonderful. I know Farda from India is also happy because uh, they know how a fluxonium is implemented. Natalia from Bolivia shares that it's great that everything is open source. And now we look forward to seeing, uh, Zara, how everything is done in the clean room. Yeah, sorry for that uh, blank out. Uh, but yeah, so I was going to say that it's kind of uh, unique that we do have our own clean room in, uh, in AQT and in Berkeley Lab. Uh, because most uh, uh, most groups have uh, to go to other facilities and such to fabricate their qubits, but everything here is uh, in-house. Uh, so everything is more controlled and um, less oh, went to the wrong room. I wanted to start from the other. Uh, less possibility of contaminations and changes uh, in the uh, <laughs> in the in the processes. So here is our gowning room. We come here, we gown up, and then, Again, I went to the wrong room. Let's see. Okay. So here is the, the we have two rooms basic. This is uh, the gambling room. We come in. This is uh, one of our scientists who's holding the door so that we can do this uh, uh, virtual tour for you guys. So inside, uh, inside this yellow room is where we start uh, our processes. So starting everything, we start with a wafer, we clean it, we spin resist, we heat up, we bake the resist, make sure that it's good. And then we have uh, e-beam lithography. So this is our very valuable tool. It's, uh, it's Wraith and it works very great. So we pattern uh, different structures that we want on this, uh, on our laptop. And then we transfer it to this computer, we create files uh, that uh, this e-beam writer will write. And then after the e-beam writer has written it, um, we go back uh, here and uh, develop it. And then we go to the other room. 
So one thing to also, sorry, this is not the most, okay, let's just go here. Yeah, okay. So one thing to notice is, uh, one thing to note is that, uh, so all of these uh, quantum uh, chip or superconducting chip that everyone talks about, there's a, uh, there, there are different versions that are possible. So you have a 3D qubit that you can, a 3D cavity or uh, your resonator can be 3D. So you can just make a qubit inside a 3D cavity and you can measure it that way, or you can do 2D fabrication, meaning that your resonator is also fabricated on chip. And uh, in this fab, we can do both. Uh, if you wanna do 3D, uh, it's basically what I just showed. You go spin, uh, you write, and then you come here and uh, we have our pluses tool, which is our deposition tool for aluminum. And then you deposit it and then you dice it and uh, that's it, that's your chip. But if you wanna do 2D, that means that you want your resonator to be niobium or tantalum, for example, then we're gonna use this other tool that we have. So we'll, first we clean our sample uh, uh, by HF and um, like Piranha and HF at different dilutions. Um, and then uh, we come and deposit niobium base or uh, tantalum base on our uh, on our sample. And then we go back to Wraith and then we pattern it and make sure that we have the structure of the resonators and capacitors and the ground plane that we want basically. And then we go and repeat this stage of uh, growing aluminum uh, junctions on it. So here we have different deposition tools. So here is uh, tantalum and niobium. Here is another uh, tantalum uh, niobium deposition tool that we have. And um, here is, what, let's just go one more. Here is the uh, process that deposits the aluminum. So this one has uh, the capability to change the angle of where we, so we place the substrate and we can uh, rotate the angle and, um, and we have different sources. So we can deposit structures of, that we uh, design with different uh, fabrication techniques, for example, like maybe people are aware of like Manhattan technique or dueling bridges. Uh, so there are different techniques that we, uh, we are capable of doing because of this tool. And uh, after we fabricate it, then there's the characterization of it. Uh, so one, uh, one characterization tool is this one, which is our probing, tool, uh, probing station. So uh, we, have, uh, we have two uh, very thin uh, needles that go on, uh, on the capacitor paddles of your uh, qubits. And then you can measure the resistance. And uh, because you know the geometry, you can transfer it back to JC or, or EJECEL and qubit parameters that you're fabricating. And um, you, we also have an SEM that uh, we can uh, SEM our um, qubits and actually look at the structure and be sure that the sizes that we're fabricating are correct. This is another deposition tool. So this one is actually home built. So this is before we get the process. And I think uh, Erfan and one of the earlier graduate students actually built this themselves. And uh, here is a wire bonder. So let's say you can kind of see a chip here actually. So let's say after you fabricate a 2D chip, you put it on a PCB and uh, then you wire bond it and you package it uh, so that you can uh, put it back into the, the fridges that uh, Castro went over. Uh, so this is basically uh, where everything happens. Not that many tools, uh, you only have like three layers of fabrication, but everything has to be precise and everything has to be done well. And then you have good devices. Yeah. Fantastic. Numerous questions. I'll ask one to Zurich Instruments first. Uh, the question there is, we saw a letter by IQM also last week. One, is the control electronics similar that they use? And I know I can ask this question to you. And, and two, uh, about the qubits that, that they use. That last question I can answer. Uh, IQM uses transmon qubits in the commercial quantum computers, but is also looking into other types of qubits like uh, Unimon superconducting qubits for their newer systems. Uh, Arash Bruno, control electronics, is that similar there for those uh, commercial quantum computing companies? 
Yeah, maybe I can take that one. Uh, the short answer is absolutely uh, yes. So it's the same uh, kind of instruments, maybe one uh, uh, refinement, especially in these uh, rack images that we have seen uh, at, uh, at AQT. Um, so we have two generations basically of the, of the electronics. Um, uh, the, the first one, uh, uh, which were purely baseband uh, electronics uh, working up to uh, half gigahertz roughly, uh, but then we're up converted with external up converters and down converters. And then the second generation, which is which are the, the instruments that we uh, showed in, in our demonstrations now. And uh, IQM actually has, has these both, uh, both generations in use. Great. Then a question to Anastasia from uh, Faraz from Pakistan. And please, uh, if you can also explain this, this question in some more detail. He asks, if the ISA has to be loaded, then wouldn't uh, a system on a chip system uh, like PY and Q sound like a better fit than FPGAs? So, yeah, I think the question is um, obviously relevant. Uh, I, I don't know this uh, other SOC that you mentioned, but in general, the SOC would be definitely a better choice because uh, the FPGA is a slower technology when it comes to the speed of the processor. Uh, we do plan uh, to have a chip made out of this. Uh, we do want to do this, uh, but for, uh, for the time being and for this small scale of the experiments, it works just as fine. We don't need to have it faster yet, uh, but uh, at this stage of the development, we need to make um, incremental improvements to the design. So the chip is when you already like decided on all of the details. Um, and the FPGA is when you are going through the uh, kind of development, like research and development process. So um, for, for this particular stage, we're, we're still good. But yes, the, the question is definitely valid. So uh, I'll, if I may add a little bit, uh, just, just to point out, so this is why I mentioned FPGA-based systems, not just FPGA systems, right? And SOCs are basically a combination that include FPGAs as well as a, a microprocessor on board. Um, and so for the latest generation of our cubic system over the last year, we've ported everything to an RF SOC, which includes the FPGA, the microprocessor, and RF components all on the same board. Um, and this will be the path actually going forward is these RF SOCs that include everything. Uh, and, and we have shown that when you add Anna's Quasar instruction set on top of this, uh, it doesn't result in any additional delays. Basically, we, we, we get roughly real time, roughly equivalent performance, just added capabilities with the ISA. We also share about the development of cryoelectronics and why that is important and, uh, and what the status is. Uh, Anna, would you like to take that or should, should I? So yeah, I can I can add a little bit, uh, and I'm I'm sure Kastra can you know add other stuff to that. So um, the the cryo control can uh, significantly reduce the uh, the delays even further. So FPJ is still a room temperature control system. So if we can move the control electronics down uh, to the fridge as close as possible to the qubits, then we will reduce those latencies even more. Um, so the complexity with that is not only that all of the um, analog components needs, needs to go there, but also all of the digital part of the control. And there are several technologies that can work in the cryo temperatures, but um, they all have the, um, um, kind of challenges and limitations when it comes to the uh, to the quantum uh, and to the quantum nature that is saying that you know you cannot really put it next to qubits and expect that qubits are not gonna uh, you know collapse uh, or something. So um, in, in in addition to that, uh, digital electronics working at the cryo temperature is a challenging task by itself. Not only not only uh, for the for the quantum purpose. Uh, so for example, superconducting uh, RSFQ uh, logic, digital logic has been 
uh, explored by the classical architects for uh, several decades, and we're still working on that, and we're still not knowing how to move forward to, to create like large chips. So um, yeah, it, it is a very interesting uh, direction, but a lot of challenges are coming uh, um, in, in, in this way. So yeah, Kasra, do you want to add something on top of that? Sure, uh, I think Anna covered most of it. I, I will just say that there's this fundamental trade-off between sampling rate uh, and heat dissipation. And uh, so if you want to do, keep doing everything digitally and, and still put your cryogenic control inside the fridge, as, say at four Kelvin, then you will dissipate, you'll, you'll have to make a, you know, uh, some sort of a trade-off, some sort of a sacrifice, either sample at much lower rates, uh, or you will end up dissipating so much heat that it won't be scalable. So you won't be able to expand this to uh, large multi-qubit systems. So that's the state of the field right now. It'll take a few more years, even for the most advanced developers until something practical can be uh, demonstrated. Thank you. And Bruno and Arash also feel free to add any time. Now over to Zara. Can you share more about the fabrication? How long does it take to make uh, to make a transmom qubit or other qubits? Uh, and a specific question uh, by Farda: What is the Manhattan technique that you mentioned? Oh yeah, so um, I start with Manhattan. So Manhattan technique um, is when you have. So you can think of like uh, when you have a mask. A mask is just basically a, a, when you have resist, you have a, a blank. Uh, like plate and then you create a pattern for Manhattan you create two uh, lines that are 90 degree to one another and uh, then uh, you do uh, it's angle evaporation so one angle you only deposit on one of the uh, one of the uh, lines that you've created and then you uh, oxidize it and so you first you have uh, aluminum and then you introduce oxygen and then you create aluminum oxide and then you deposit the second layer, you rotate it, deposit the second layer and then you have one. So basically you end up with one layer aluminum, uh, oxygen in between second layer of aluminum and that's the creation of Josephson junction. So Manhattan is like the simplest version or the most standard version that people use for in superconducting qubits. And all transmons usually are Manhattan because it's the yield is very high, it's very robust, you can make it. Um, for to, to make like a qubit, um, depending on what you're making, it can, uh, it can range from like a, two day to a week and a half. So if everything goes smoothly, a week and a half. So for example, like uh, the, the samples that I, uh, the, the last sample that I made, which is a eight qubit, um, six flexonium, two transmon, um, it took me a week and a half. So make the base. So first layer is depositing the, uh, the base layer for the resonator, pattern it, uh, etch it, uh, deposit the uh, fabricate the the junctions and then you need band-aids um, band-aids is uh, because you have a base layer of niobium and then you have aluminum junction on top and then you don't have good electrical conduction because there might be uh, or there is for sure oxygen between them so uh, that oxygen is a dielectric so basically you do ion milling and you remove that uh, the top layer of uh, niobium and the top layer of, of aluminum that you've deposited and you deposit another layer of aluminum that is basically like we call it band-aid you can think of it at really like a band-aid that you put on two things and you connect them together so um, that's how you create electrical conduction and then um, and then you have to dice it and then you have to package it so really from the beginning. So from the beginning of like a blank wafer until you package it, very, very good, very fast, a week and a half to two weeks, yeah. Yeah, also I would like to comment on that. The week and a half is very impressive, I would say, in terms of my interaction with other groups. Usually, uh, it, I think that in AQT, everything is optimized and the whole fabrication process is optimized. They have all of the, uh, requirements are starting from electron beam lithography to the end, but uh, usually I would say my experience with other groups have been on average three or four weeks uh, to just start with, and then the qubit is still, it's very hard, it's not very easy to fabricate, but uh, at the end of the day, there are questions of characterization going in, and if the qubit is not performing well, then uh, there are measures to detect that and so on and so forth. But yeah, we kind of have is very impressive at AQT. 
Yeah, thank you. But it's, you know, we do those tests, make sure that the, the, the process is like very well optimized. But as you said, like if, if no tool breaks a week and a half, a tool breaks, then it depends on when we fix it. Yeah. Regarding this optimization of the fab, David asks, how hard is it to transfer the HUT fab into a mass production fab? Hard. Very, very hard. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> so it's like, you know, even one thing that one person optimizes, if the second person comes and do it, uh, there is some variation. Some of the stuff like are temperature dependent. So if they're, so one week, everything is like cold, like, you know, Bay Area is usually cold, like moderately cold. So we're like, okay, the weather is good. Like we, we optimize something and then we hit a, a hot week and all of our fabrication suddenly is not working well. So, you know, mass production, we need a lot more control. Yeah. The reality kicking in. <laughs> I will mix in a couple of workforce questions before we go technical again. I will also add Chunyan uh, to the group again. Can you all share what kind of backgrounds are you looking for? What kind of skills are you looking for to work at AQT, to work at Zurich Instruments? What are really the needs? What should everyone focus on to work at your places? Let's start with uh, Zurich Instruments. Um, Chunyan and then Bruno and Arash, please share as well. You are unmuted, Junyan. Okay, yeah. Um, first of all, thanks. Question. So, in general, um, I think this question probably is similar as what uh, I uh, answered in the very beginning of, of the web, uh, webinar. Um, related with the the related to the um, uh, the the physics background. And um, and the, the knowledge uh, in in uh, quantum computing or quantum technology, um, this is in general is essential. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, it's, it's more in the um, experiment experiments part or our theoretical part. Um, and uh, yeah. I think for this this uh, field it is very very much uh, focused on this, and we do need um, in that sense people bring this knowledge, and we uh, <laughs> we can bring more uh, to customers. Yeah, and yes. please, Anastasia, uh, before you go, Arash, Anastasia, could you add because you come from a different background uh, and have a expert role in the quantum domain. Uh, so. Um, it is yeah. It is very important to have people like with this different background, and uh, especially um, you know classical experimentation, FPGAs, uh, ARTL, um, which is like uh, the uh, hardware description language, right? So, uh, but also some understanding of the uh, quantum information science. Uh, so it is a learning curve, but uh, I do usually encourage uh, everyone who is even slightly interested in quantum to kind of uh, come and learn and like, um, you know, that's an interesting journey, but I think it's worth it to, um, you know, to learn as much as possible about other fields. <laughs> I love that advice. Yeah. And that is what everyone here is doing extremely actively in a, in a very diverse way in quantum. Yes, over to you, Arash. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to comment on both Chunyan and Anesthesia. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Uh, there is going to be a learning, uh, a learning curve that contributes to that. But the question is of how you can get involved into the industry as a whole, regardless of the uh, company specific. You, Of course, there are going to be needs to various type of backgrounds, including electrical engineering, computer science, in addition to the physics and quantum. Those levels are actually very essential right now. And the way you can get in, uh, involved in this type of activities, not only through the scientific level jobs, but also through technical sales jobs or a technical uh, R&D jobs that kind of like have hands-on experience, although they don't know the complete full stacks and how they connect each other and uh, how they work with each other. And that's exactly the part, at least in the uh, Zurich Instrument Boston office, uh, we 
are looking for. So people who have expertise or background in physics and quantum computing, of course, on the scientific side, but also people who even have expertise in um, tangential fields such as electrical engineering and they are able to interact with the customers and understand what they need and then they can build up their knowledge by interacting with more phd physicists and the people who are involved in that and then uh, they can just grow together in addition to that uh, there are various type of internships uh, that for example the one that we offer is a six-month internship we go to zurich and uh, in the Boston office, we offer that. And you go to the Zurich and then do some part of your internship there and coming back here to do the rest of that and collaboration with academics and our key, um, basically customers. There are various projects we are working on and we can have people on those projects uh, if basically everything aligns perfectly, especially if you're a, uh, there's a group in your university or advisor that already uses Zurich Instruments devices. That's a very perfect fit. Just let them know that you're interested in a collaborative projects, and then we'll be happy to chip in and uh, help to basically develop a career for for the future generation. Great, and there is a really a, there is really a need for everyone. Some concluding remarks from you, Kasra, before answering more different questions. Uh, sure. Uh, I would say that in general, quantum computing is probably the most multidisciplinary challenge that exists right now. Uh, and uh, no matter what you do, you will be able to find a way to contribute. There will be different amounts of opportunities depending on, on your particular uh, technical subfield. Uh, but yeah, we have, especially in, in an experimental lab such as the AQT, uh, as long as you know programming, like the, 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 the absolute minimum requirement is you should be comfortable with uh, programming Python notebooks, I ideally know a little bit of firmware programming and familiarity with programming devices. But beyond that, electrical engineering is helpful, a physics background, chemistry background, material science background. Um, you can find a way, even, even mathematicians uh, on the algorithm side, there's room to, to uh, contribute. Uh, I would say there's, you know, and right now, you know, if you look at the history of development of different fields, usually everything comes out of physics and applied physics. And then once it's established enough, it becomes its own field, electrical engineering or mechanical or computer science. Um, and quantum will take another five to 10 years at least until it really can claim to be its own field. And for now, from whatever background, you can find a way to, to, to contribute. And that also answers Drew's question, masters in physics, but no quantum computing experience, would you be considered? Yes, especially if you have solid programming experience and, and general insight. Uh, Kasra, um, Maya has a question for you specifically. You switched fields earlier. Can you share a bit about that and what challenges did you face when changing fields to, um, to physics and quantum computing? Um, sure. Well, okay. I never switched fields into physics, really. I, I've been studying physics since undergrad. That was one of my fields. In undergrad, I studied electrical engineering and computer science, but in addition, also math and physics. Um, in uh, grad school, I was doing applied physics nominally, but really kind of using all of those. Uh, I, I, I had a multidisciplinary pro, uh, research project for my PhD, which was uh, the development of a computational x-ray microscope at the advanced light source synchrotron facility and which was not like i kept in touch with quantum but my research didn't in, involve quantum even quantum mechanics let alone quantum computing um and uh but you know i i was very multidisciplinary very hands-on but also able to think in abstract terms and and theoretically and uh that made it uh made me a good fit you know, five years ago when I was finishing up my PhD uh, to then switch into quantum computing. Uh, it will become more and more difficult to switch fields as the field specializes more and more. Um, but, you know, I, I would say you, you shouldn't say no to yourself. You should just apply and, and, and see what opportunities are out there. Uh, as long as you're willing and able to, to expand, apply the skills that you already have and pick up new skills, uh, you should be fine. 
And this also holds for the question that Ibrahim asks now, can fresh bachelor graduates apply for internships without other uh, previous research experience? Yes, apply. Let's go to a more technical question again. Um, Ron from Chicago asks, what is the ratio of off-the-shelf uh, classical support electronics versus custom-built devices for the AQT crew? Um, that's uh, okay. So that's that's been an evolving thing. Uh, really, the way so we've had uh, essentially we've had Zurich instruments as our default for our user programs, uh, for, for our user projects. Uh, we do find that we do need our, our own in house uh, system, our, our own open source control system, Cubic, for some more specialized experiments where we do need deep access. Uh, and, you know, it really depends on the mix of projects that we have uh, at the moment, which one we use more. And then from Victor, what kind of theoretical research is needed at AQT? and perhaps also at Zurich Instruments. Looking forward to hearing more about that after. So at AQT, yeah, at AQT we don't, uh, we collaborate with theorists, but we're primarily an experimental lab. Uh, so for example, if you're an algorithms expert and you do not have hands-on skills uh, and you don't want to really be involved in, in anything hands-on, then it would be harder for you to, uh, or almost impossible to, to join AQT. Um, and, you know, when people do join us, they usually come from some sort of an experimental background, uh, and we train them even more on the full stack, everything from the helium compressor to uh, cryogenics to controls to running algorithms. So by the time they finish their PhD or postdoc, they will know a little bit about everything. Uh, yeah, a, a pure theorist, you know, there are theory labs and theory groups for working on um, circuit QED for working on quantum algorithms, but we collaborate with them. We don't hire them. Thank you. Any theorists, uh, uh, colleagues for you, Arash and Bruno? Yeah, that's uh, even uh, even if it might be su surprising, but uh, but yes, even uh, physics theory. I don't know if the person that I think of has actually. A, a, a theory physics background, but the topic that that person works on. Uh, is exactly algorithms and uh, and quantum error correction. So, thinking about a question of how to, for instance, uh, get uh, quantum error correction decoders to work on hardware is a really a, a task that is beyond maybe the uh, what we from the experimental physics are specialized in, uh, and and uh, and also uh, the electric engineers. So this is a, a domain which gets more and more important to us as. Uh, we go with our products or our solution more and more towards higher level in software. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Bruno and I'll comment on that. We have this Lab 1Q uh, software that's most of the experiments and some of the experiments and uh, basically the quantum error correction codes that we're trying to implement and integrating that and communication with open chasm and so on and so forth can benefit a lot from theoretical uh, point of view. So essentially, as Castro mentioned, as long as you know how to program and usually theoretical people are very good at programming, then you'll be able to uh, participate in these activities and uh, basically contribute a share into the whole stack. So the answer is also yes to Varda's question. I'll ask, can someone with a background in data science transition into quantum computing? Now, an interesting quest question from uh, Mohammad Raza uh, from Iran. Are there any particular experimental processes that would need theoretical explanation, but you are not satisfied yet with that theoretical explanation? Um, sure. This is why this is why we work with theorists in part. Is uh, we we find things we we either find experiments uh, experimental results that can't be justified with existing by existing theory or. Uh, we want to ex extend the reach of existing concepts for experiments. Uh, and so both of these are valid reasons to work with theorists and we do that. And then there are yeah. some questions about the cost. <laughs> how, how easy it would be to set up such a lab. L let me ask, uh, there was a somewhat uh, broader question too. 
um, how likely it is, how likely is it for large scale quantum computing uh, labs, for example, based on superconducting qubits, but also others to be uh, geographically based in specific countries. And this can be due to many circumstances, of course, um, including weather conditions. Um, and I think advanced quantum test bed has a really interesting concept. I would love to, to hear your view on this and also how such uh, test beds can, can improve, uh, improve access for everyone. Um. I mean, so you you do need uh, you you do need uh, precision control over various factors, and uh, as long as you can you can build a state of the art uh, scientific uh, building, scientific lab, uh, then you can you know do that anywhere. You can. It, it would obviously be harder to build such a thing. Uh, either at like North Pole or in the middle of the desert or or something like that, it's it's easier to operate such a such a building closer to, and and with greater access to uh, all sorts of different expertise. Uh, but no, really, yeah, uh, you 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 just need to be able to attract a, a multidisciplinary team uh, to contribute to the to the different parts of this. And so, at Berkeley, it's been easy for us to do that partly. Because Berkeley has had a long tradition of excellence in 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 many many different scientific fields, and so we have, uh, you know, attracting the right talent has been a problem for many labs, and we've not really had an issue with that. Uh, so I think that's the main challenge: is is to be able to to build a team with deep expertise in many different parts of the stack. Then over to a question from Marceline. She asks. What are some of the major challenges facing the quantum computing industry currently? Curious for your views first from Zurich Instruments. Yeah, I can start and then maybe Barun and Shunyan can uh, basically elaborate on that. So right now we're in the NISC area. Uh, the question will be about scaling and how to scale properly. There has been many conversation in this uh, last few minutes and hour even about the direction into the scaling and various type of cryogenic electronics as well as the high temperature uh, electronics and how they work together and so on and so forth and there are still open questions there's a still optimization that should go on in the power dissipation of the cryogenic electronics or if that's going to be the good direction or not uh, and there is still many questions going on but that's one of the challenges. Uh, and then in addition to that, on the fabrication side, there are many challenges in addressing the noise uh, channels in the qubit. And for example, you can use superconductor resonator as a proxy for qubit to address them and segregate various type of noises and so on and so forth. And still that's an active research that people are uh, looking into and trying to address. There was this question that's uh, answered by Castro about if really the high temperature superconductivity can help and the answer exactly as Kastra mentioned is like not really the, the what matters is the coherence length in that superconductor and as long as we get to the lowest temperature in the superconductivity regime the coherence th length uh, yeah will not be that much temperature dependent uh, again depending on the material but uh, those are all of the challenges and people are working on so essentially at the end of the day you want to reduce the noise to a level that's few qubits is equivalent to one logical qubits and by logical qubits uh, what we mean as a company is essentially the the qubit that equivalent to one logical uh, qubit that you see in an algorithm and that's the base uh, move uh, toward those reducing the noise and again um, till we get there we have to work in the NISC regime scaling and one of the main challenges is that so if Bruno and Shunyan if you have further comments yeah, and much more on this we will also see in the hardware panel the first one on the 19th in two days and uh, next week the second hardware panel with all qubit modalities uh, represented and there will be some battle going on what will be the best quantum computer Arash, Bruno, Shunyan, Kasra thank you so much this was an amazing session